Welcome to uh, New America. I'm Peter Bergen, Vice President of New America. Uh, very honored uh, to introduce our, our guest, Charles Glass, who's a fellow with New America International Security Program, the author of multiple books, including Tribes with Flags, The Tribes Triumphant, uh, our books about uh, focused on the Middle East, his books on the Second World War, include uh, Americans in Paris, Life and Death Under the Nazi Occupation, and also The Deserters, A Hidden History of World War II. Uh, today, we're going to be talking about his new book, which just came out, Soldiers Don't Go Mad, A Story of Brotherhood, Poetry, and Mental Illness During the First World War, which uh, got a very nice review already in the Washington Post. Um, Charlie was uh, formerly the ABC News, Bureau, ABC News Beirut Bureau Chief. Um, he was also the ABC News Chief Middle East Correspondent. He's written for multiple magazines and newspapers around the world, contributes regularly to the New York Review of Books, and I'm going to turn it over to Charlie to discuss his latest book. Well, thank you very much, Peter. Um, I started on this book, I read a little piece in the newspaper about a hospital in Scotland called Craig Lockhart War Hospital for Officers. It opened in the First World War, and I knew nothing about it, so I, I actually I went up to the place, which still exists, uh, to find out what happened and why it was opened and who was treated there. Uh, I discovered that it was the leading psychiatric hospital in the First World War for British officers. The reason they took such care for officers is that, they, is that the officers were breaking down in great, greater percentage than their actual numbers, uh, and they were needed at the front to lead their platoons and companies in battle. Um, hundreds of thousands of British soldiers, French soldiers, German soldiers were reporting to hospitals uh, during the war at the height of battle with no visible wounds. They, they were blind, they couldn't talk, they were shaking or they were paralyzed. They couldn't move, they couldn't think. They were having terrible nightmares and they were unable to sleep. And the doctors couldn't find a physical cause for it. But the soldiers themselves started calling this, this malady shell shock. They were shocked by the shells because they, this was the first war in which they were subjected to high explosive heavy artillery regularly daily hourly while they crouched underground in their trenches living with lice and rats and very bad food and just trying to survive and it, the pressure was so great that the numbers of mental casualties were at least about about 20 percent as as many as there were physical casualties and these men were suffering greatly some hospitals that they went to simply regarded them as cowards and, and thought that they were useless and they tried to give them electroshock therapy, anything to get them to go back to the front. But at Craig Lockhart Hospital, there were two extremely good, well-educated psychiatrists. One was called Dr. William Hulse Rivers, who in addition to being a psychiatrist was a neurologist and an anthropologist who had uh, worked in the South Seas and in India among what uh, other people, not him, called primitive peoples. He, he always rejected the idea there was such a thing as primitive people. He thought all people were equal. He was, he was very rare uh, for someone of his time and his class that he wasn't a racist in any way at all. And he was very sympathetic to the officers who came to be treated by him. The other, the other psychiatrist was a man called Dr. Arthur Brock. Brock was a Scottish psychiatrist, also a neurologist, and like Rivers, he had studied in journey, he studied psychology on psychoanalysis, listening to the men, listening, un interpreting their dreams as Freud did with his patients, and trying to understand the causes of their symptoms. It wasn't enough just to cure the symptoms. It was important to get to the cause, to find out the triggering event that caused these horrible symptoms that they were suffering, and then to begin their treatment. And then and then ultimately, and one they hope, to get them to go back to the front and lead men in battle. This was easier said than done. And most most men were never able to go back to battle. Most of the men and officers were not able to go back to battle despite um, the great efforts of these, of these psychiatrists at Craig Lockhart and other hospitals. It, at Craig Lockhart, it stands out because early in, 19, it, it opened in October, 1916. It had a, a capacity of about 150 men. By the end of the war, it, it treated about 1,800. Uh, one of the early people who came was a young uh, 
second lieutenant called Wilfred Owen. And Owen was an aspiring poet. Uh, he had been buried under, he had been blown into the air, been buried underground. He had been stuck in a trench or in a ditch uh, for days under relentless uh, artillery bombardment and machine gun fire in full view of the body of one of his comrades who was who was who had been killed days before and whose whose remains were still hanging on barbed wire in front of him being eaten by maggots in p and he, the body was in p lieutenant uh, lieutenant gaukrager uh, owen was very badly shocked by this but he still went back to when the when the shelling ceased he went back to try and continue fighting but his men and other officers noticed that he was trembling he could barely control himself as hard as he tried. So he was sent to a casualty clearing station and ultimately was sent back to England and then up to Scotland to the Greg Lockhart Hospital where Dr. Arthur Brock treated him. And Brock, uh, for, for Owen Brock was the ideal psychiatrist. Brock believed in something called ergotherapy in addition to psychotherapy, ergo being work therapy, that you, you have to work, you have to do things you have to engage with your community. So he got Owen to edit the in-house journal, the Hydra. He got Owen to uh, go to uh, teach young boys uh, literature. He got him to learn German. He, he was constant. Owen was constantly active, and it, this was very was a key to his um, his recovery. But while he was there, he read a book of poetry by another officer called Siegfried Sassoon, who was then fighting in France. And Sassoon wrote a, uh, a book of poetry called The Old Huntsman. And in the book, there were some anti-war poems, which Owen responded to greatly because his experience of the war was nothing like the propaganda that surrounded the war, the, the, the great glorious war in which all the men were brave and everybody did well. He knew that was a lie. And he read Sassoon and for the first time could see in poetry the profundity of that lie. And he wanted, he, while he was there, he heard that Sassoon had also come to Craig Lockhart to be treated. Uh, and so he went, he waited about, he was very shy, uh, Owen. He waited about three weeks and then went to Sassoon's room and knocked on his door and brought several copies of The Old Huntsman for Sassoon to sign. Sassoon was very unimpressed. Uh, Owen was much shorter than he was. He was uh, from the lower middle class. Sassoon from the upper middle class. And in England, that's quite a big deal. And they, um, but he liked it. They, they got on they got on very well and uh, Owen asked him to sign copies of the book for his family and for for himself and as he left he he said um I'm a poet too he first time he admitted it to anyone outside his family and uh, Sassoon didn't think anything of it but as the months went by Sassoon was reading Owen's poetry helping him to improve it but came to the conclusion that Owen was a better poet than he was although Sassoon was a published and famous poet and also a very, a very brave officer who had won the military cross, Owen had not uh, distinguished himself in battle at all at that stage. And he, um, he, he, he came to rely on Sassoon as a mentor. Uh, but uh, Sassoon was actually not there because he was he had broken down. Sassoon was there because he was a political prisoner, effectively. He had published a letter called A Protest Against the War, in which he condemned the war and condemned the politicians for prolonging the war and not negotiating a peace with Germany. And rather than court martial him, which would have been a, a, a scandal in Britain because Sassoon had won the military cross, he was a published poet, and his first cousin, Philip Sassoon, was a member of parliament and the aide de camp of, of the British commander of all the British forces in France. So they, rather than risk the publicity of a court martial, they sent him to a medical board and had him declared insane and sent him to Craig Lockhart to be treated. And there he was treated by Dr. Rivers, um, who tried to talk him out of his passiveness. Uh, it wasn't really psychological. It was, it was political. And they had debates rather than psychological therapy. But it was an interesting time for both men. And they became very close. Uh, Sassoon called Rivers his father confessor and relied on him a great deal even after the war. Yeah, so I mean, reading the book uh, last night, you know, one of the things that was striking was um, the psychiatrists involved felt that um, you mentioned this triggering event that that their patients should actually relive the experiences that had sort of set them down the path. I guess the 
in previous uh in general the treatment for people with this shell shock had been like we just let you be and do a sleep and i mean there were this was a, a new approach to this issue right it was a new approach but it wasn't a universal approach there are other hospitals uh one headed by a canadian doctor called lewis yellen who didn't take the problem seriously and and felt that he could simply eliminate the symptoms by using electroshock therapy and and there are examples of him which he which he recorded uh putting electric shocks in a man forcing him to talk and he could he wouldn't take the electric shocks off until the man could actually speak and then he could speak because it because he was so uh suffering so much he finally spoke and then he regard and, and yelland and others like him regarded that as a cure and sent those men back to the front where they not surprisingly broke down again it was it was only psychiatrists like rivers and brock who wanted to go to the causes so they wouldn't break down again so they would understand their fears and they would understand that it was natural to be to be afraid in those circumstances it was, it was a rivers in, wrote in, in in an essay called the repression of war experience about the fight or flight syndrome so you're there you're leading men and you have to fight but you know you're going to be killed it's very, 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 you've seen everyone being around, you're going to be killed, but you're actually, so you're tempted to run. So you, but you don't run because you don't want to desert your lives. That's when you break down. And that's, that's what they, they had to get to the root of that in order to cure them. You have a striking scene in the book, which I think helps understand the scale of the problem, which is the Battle of the Somme, which I guess is the most, uh, was that the most lethal day for British soldiers ever? It was the 1st of June 1916 when General Haig decided to break through the German lines with a massive assault, which uh, he proceeded with days of heavy artillery fire, thus alerting the Germans to the fact that, the, that there was going to be an attack along that line. Um, and the Germans had observed the mobilization of forces from their, their um, observation balloons. So when, when the morning came, the, the the shelling ceased and men were led across the line by their officers, many officers unarmed, into the German machine guns and German artillery across no man's land. No man's land was a wasteland of barbed wire, shell holes, mud, uh, mines. It, it was a, a killing zone. On that day, the 1st of July, 1916, 20,000 British soldiers died between dawn and dusk, 20,000, and another 40,000 physically wounded. At the hospitals, the, the Catholic clearing stations that night and in the days that followed, men were coming without limbs, men were coming who had been, had their face, half of their faces blown off, they'd lost their eyes, they were bleeding to death. But there were also men who were completely unmarked, not a mark on them, who couldn't move, who were if they moved at all, they were trembling. They couldn't walk. Some of them, because of what they'd seen, they'd actually gone blind, psychosomatically blind, or they couldn't describe what they had experienced. They they went they went mute. They couldn't speak at all. They couldn't say any words at all. And the psychiatrists, at that stage, in the early stage of the war, were unsure how to cope with all of this. And it was and and it was only as time went on and and the the treatment, the psychiatrists learned what these men were going through and learned ways of dealing with them that they were able, in some but not all cases, to treat them and make them make them better, allow some of them to go back to the front when they were fully cured, and some of them to take on light duty in Britain. They could still go on being soldiers, but they were not capable of going back to the front, or they were in such bad shape that they were dismissed from the from the service. They were given discharges from the service and, and sent home. You've covered a lot of wars in your career. Have you seen, I mean, we, we call this today, I, I guess, PTSD. Um, I mean, is this something that you've encountered in, in the wars that you've covered since? Uh, obviously, World War One was a very extreme event, but every war has uh, has its horrors. Well, in World War One, it was it was mainly soldiers. It wasn't a, a war that involved civilians in large numbers. There were um, farmers in the war zone in Be France and Belgium who went on growing the food to feed to feed France and Belgium, but, and they suffered. But mostly, almost ninety nine percent 
casualties were, were military. In the wars that I covered, it was the opposite. Most of the casualties are civilians in the Balkans, in Sarajevo, or in Beirut, or uh, in the Middle East. Uh, it, it, they're, they're fighting in cities, fighting around, like in Ukraine today, they're fighting in cities, and, and it's, the, it's the civilians are suffering. And I, re, and I remember after the uh, massacre that the Israelis sponsored at Sabra and Shatila refugee camps in 1982, uh, even a year later, uh, women were still wailing and screaming and, and they, because they'd seen their children shot before their eyes by a Christian militiamen. And they were they had the worst case of, of uh, what we now call PTSD that I have ever witnessed. And I don't think that they got any treatment. They were they were they suffered and they and they they went on suffering and they were they were left to languish with their with their grief and their pain. And of course, in Ukraine today, there's fighting in the cities, but there's also trench warfare. I mean, there's a it's kind there of is, and, and I, I would not be surprised to find that under the under those conditions, a lot of a lot of soldiers will break down on both sides. If you have questions, put them in the Slido uh, on on the, on the screen, and I will relay them. So, what was your uh, writing process uh, for this book? Well. Uh... <laughs> I don't really have a process. I I do a lot of research, and then I sit down and write. And then when I'm writing, I discover I need to do more research. Uh, I went up to to Scotland to uh, find everything that was still at the at the Craig Lockhart Hospital. It's no longer a hospital; it belongs to something called Edinburgh Napier University. But they preserved a small part of it as a war poet's collection. Uh, I went to the to the battlefronts in in France and Belgium to where where all those men had fought to the place where Wilfred Owen uh, had his breakdown, where, where Sassoon fought, where he won his military cross. And then I went to the archives, uh, in Brit the National Archives in Britain and the, uh, and the Imperial War Museum archives, and through the help of some families got diaries and letters of some of the soldiers who, who had broken down during the war. And then it was just a matter of putting it all together, coming up with a manuscript that was, was too long, and turning it over to my editor at Penguin, Ann Godoff, who helped me to make it readable, uh, something for which I am grateful. And mm -hmm. uh, and then that, and that was it. Then we had a book you know, four years after I started. And Godoff is a pretty legendary uh, letter, uh, editor at Penguin. Have you done all your books with her? Or? Uh, Tribes of Flags, Americans in Paris, Deserters, and They Fought Alone. So four, this is the fifth book we've done together. That's great. Um, and you also, you mentioned the acknowledgments that you had a near fatal encounter with COVID uh, when you were writing this. Yes, in March of uh, 2021, before they were, um, before we had the vaccines, uh, I was in Italy and I started feeling a bit rough. Uh, I wasn't sure, but then I went and had myself tested and it was COVID. But as you know, you, you can have COVID seriously or not very seriously. Uh, and I thought I could just ride it out. In the event, I couldn't. I, I finally uh, passed out and, and friends called an ambulance and they took me off to intensive care uh, at the Santa Maria Annunziata Hospital where I received excellent care. I was there for two weeks. Um, I had double I had double pneumonia and COVID at the same time. And they put me wow. on steroids and uh, antibiotics and oxygen. Uh, but they they did a wonderful job, and then and then I came out and I, I recovered fairly quickly, and, and I did. I luckily I didn't have long COVID, I, I, and then I was able to go back to work on the book. Well, that's yeah, very good news. So when you when you when you started the book, did you know? And Wilfred Owen and Sigrid Sassoon are the two great poets of World War One, two of the great poets of uh, that Britain has produced. Did you know going in that they'd both gone to this institution, or how did you? Well, I did because I, I, I then got uh, Pat Barker's Regeneration Trilogy, which I recommend to anybody. There are three magnificent novels, mostly set uh, at Craig Lockhart, involving Owen Sassoon and, and Dr. Rivers. I mean, it's, it's a fictional account. Mine's a nonfiction account, but hers is beautiful. So I knew from that that um, Sassoon and Owen were not only there, but they helped each other to write their poetry there. And some of their best poems were written at Craig Lockhart. Owen, as editor of the Hydra, the, the in-house journal, uh, published Sassoon, and at Sassoon's insistence, finally published himself for the first time. And it was a, it was a breakthrough for him to be to have other people reading his poetry, and it was the beginning of what would have been a great career if he had not been cured. Uh, 
uh, and sent back to the front where he was ultimately killed. Because the point was to send, they weren't really looking to just to cure people. They wanted to send them back into the battle zone, right? They... No, the whole purpose, it was like um, a machine shop for damaged tanks and trucks. It was to fix them to go back and do their job as officers at the front. It was not you know, because they sympathized with them or wanted to help them per se. <laughs> was a military issue and these were military psychiatrists some of the psychiatrists felt torn that once they cured these men that they'd get that they'd become close to they'd listen to them tell their problems um that they were that when they certified them as 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 cured that they would go back and either be killed or 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 have a mental breakdown again and it was it was a it was very difficult for the psychiatrists to to face that dilemma um, in terms of British society in general, was did did the average person recognize that shell shock was a, a real thing and people were not malingering, they were not just trying to get out of fighting, or what, what was the the, overall... the the widespread view, the widespread view in the military, uh, particularly in the senior officer class, staff officer class, and in the general public and in the newspapers, was that um shell shock was just a, oh, an excuse to try and get out of battle. It wasn't. It right. wasn't a real thing. Uh, and that, even, even to the end of the war, even after the war, right? There's that famous scene when General Patton sort of uh, berates somebody who's got shell shock in World War II, um, and I think Eisenhower sort of reprimand, reprimanded him, right? For, a, but I mean this this view that what we call PTSD or shell shock um, is uh, sort of made up. It was. I mean, it persists. I, I don't think it. The, does it persist today, or is it is that mostly just sort of a something? I don't think I don't think it persists today. I I I have um, British friends who were officers in Iraq and Afghanistan who have PTSD. Have it, I mean, had it long after uh, they they left uh, the the theaters of war, uh, and they they received medical care, and they uh, they were not in any way disparaged or or looked down upon because because of what happened to them. I, I think times that have change for the better in that regard the medical care isn't that great by the way but it's it's not it's not given with any malice it's not it's not saying we, it, we're just doing this because we believe you're actually a coward they don't say that anymore yeah and there seems to be also a movement with ptsd to uh i mean more inventive approaches like using psychedelics or um other kinds of drugs to get people to uh i mean it, it but it seems to be efforts to uh, come up with better treatment. Well, there are a lot of experimental things, as you say, psychedelics and also um, flashing lights going back and forth. That seems to help some people. Uh, it's it, it, what works for one doesn't necessarily work for another. It's yeah. it, it's, become, it's not one illness. It's 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 a number of illnesses and and psychiatrists are still working on ways of helping each individual and then there is something else which is related but not something called moral injury which can reveal itself you know for instance drone pilots who may actually not be on a battlefield uh, but spend a lot of time with the people that are going to be killed actually feel some form of stress because they've been living you know if you drop a bomb from a plane you you don't know who the victim is, but if you're a drone pilot spending maybe weeks or months following a particular person around before they before the uh, before the weapon is launched, uh, that can be also very disturbing. Well, I'm not surprised. I would I would not really want to sit in a little room in Nevada and kill a family in Afghanistan. <laughs> the, the, the PTSD is is not just a wartime phenomenon; it's a peacetime phenomenon as well. I mean, the most 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 of the sufferers of PTSD in America today are people who have been raped. They're, they're traumatized, and that is that was a trauma that left them traumatized. That accounts for most of the cases of PTSD in America today. Um, and then there is also, um, you know, there are these cases of mass psychosis, which uh, is more common than we might imagine. An example of which is in Sweden, where uh, a, uh, hundreds and hundreds of Swedish kids have essentially um, uh, gone to sleep. They they are on uh, life support, but they they're all mostly Yazidis. Interestingly, 
uh, who, whose families face uh, are, are trying to get asylum, which is very complicated. And they have this thing called resignation syndrome where they collectively fall asleep. So all by way of saying that is the mind is uh, often, uh, you know, can do a lot of things to the body that we don't completely understand. Well, I can understand the Yazidis being traumatized. After all, they went through uh, at the hands of the Islamic State. I mean, they were victims of genocide. Yeah. Uh, and the women were slavery and the children, the boys were killed. I mean, they, 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 the, uh, it's, uh, what they went through is unimaginable. And just, I don't know how people survive that. I don't know how a psychiatrist can deal with it. You have to try, but it's 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 more than more than the heart can bear. Yeah, when you know, going to your point about peacetime. I mean, so what happens with these kids is they've had this extremely traumatic experience. They go to Sweden seeking seeking asylum. Asylum there is pretty complicated. It can take a long time, and the kids kind of know that it's not going well. And then as a co coping mechanism. One of them fell asleep, and now hundreds of them have fallen asleep in this sort of collective psychosis. So it's a it's a form of PTSD, and which has a very particular um, way of revealing itself. Which is um, they they go to sleep, they're on life support, they're eating, they're they're fine, they can survive for years like this. Um, but let me ask you about the title of your book. It's Soldiers Don't Go Mad. Uh, how did you select the title? I uh, soon wrote a poem using the title, actually, of, of Rivers's essay, The Repression of War Experience. And he said, soldiers don't go mad until they lose control of ugly thoughts that send them jabbering among the trees. So it was, it, he was undercutting the official view that soldiers don't go mad. Yeah. I thought, I thought it was the appropriate title. And, and, and it also helped that he wrote it at Craig Lockhart, which is where the most of the book. The book is set in two places, at the front, where the these incidents happened that traumatized them and at Craig Lockhart where they dealt with those, those experiences. And the, um, in terms of, so how does the, I haven't read the entire book. I mean, so how, what is the denouement of all this? Well, Sassoon and Owen both um, are treated and uh, as and I, I talk about other soldiers, but I, I won't go into all of them now. Um, they both treated, and they both go back to the front. Sassoon went back, and he was wounded, and he came had to come back to England as a, because he was wounded. But he was also this time uh, not uh, not not uh, there because of the protests, and not and not staying too long because of the physical wound. He he actually was traumatized the second time, and he went back to Craig Lockhart, which he, a place he hated, couldn't stand Craig Lockhart. He didn't want to be there. He didn't feel that he was crazy. He felt he didn't belong there. He spent four days at Craig Lockhart in, um, in 1918. And uh, Dr. Rivers realizing that he, he, he shouldn't be there. They, he sent him to an auxiliary uh, hospital in a stately home called Lennel House, where there was a much more relaxed regime and the officers, there were no psychiatrists living there. Rivers would go and visit him there. And uh, a woman called Lady Clementine Waring looked after the men as if they were house guests and he had a better time there oh and he didn't go and he wasn't allowed to go back to france he wanted to but he wasn't allowed to go back to france owen went back to france and astoundingly he wrote some of his finest poetry while in action he became a very brave officer he won the military cross he was leading his men across a channel in france the sum it was uh, canal uh, into German machine gun fire, patting his men on the back saying, come on, boys, let's do it. We'll go. We'll, we'll, we'll get them. And then he was cut down and killed four days before the, the armistice before that ended the war. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that is, that is a day anymore. And, but Sassoon didn't know about it till months later. He heard about it months later and heard about everything that had happened. And he had, he had received letters from Owen in France that Owen had written before he died, but he, but he received them after he died. And he realized how profoundly he had affected Owen and how much Owen valued his opinion of his poetry. And so soon was then involved in having volumes of Owen's poetry published after the war as a, as a tribute to, the, to his comrade and friend. There's, a, there's another um, aspect to their, to their relationship. Both men were homosexual at a time when mm. homosexuality was illegal. I mean, it was only a few years before that Oscar Wilde was sent to prison for homosexuality. 
uh, and they had to suppress it. So uh, you know, apart from uh, their war trauma, they had to deal with suppressing their physical nature. Uh, and that, that was an added thing, but it was, but it was something that it helped to create a bond between them because they both understood what they were going through with that. Had there, had there been previous conflicts where this kind of shell shock had existed? Uh... There, I think in all previous conflicts, some people have gone mad, depending on the circumstances. Uh, in the American Civil War, uh, there were many um, men who broke down uh, and and the psychi the, there were no psychiatrists, but the doctors called their um, breakdown without physical wounds. They called it windage. So what they were saying was that the wind created by a bullet going past you or a shell landing near you that doesn't actually hit you somehow disrupted the nervous system in the spine, and that that was that was what caused them to go a bit crazy. I, in 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 my own family. My grandmother's father uh, fought with the Illinois Regiment in the Civil War, and she said that she was born. She was born just after the Civil War, but she said that she would go and see him in his room, in his rocking chair, just staring like this, just staring for hours. I mean, I, I, a lot of those men in the in the Civil War, or in the First World War, in the Spanish American War, and any war you can name never got over it and and the, some of those some of the men that i write about who were not cured or not did not this the, the therapy was not successful 30 40 years after after the war if they heard a car backfire would jump under the bed shaking one woman remembered seeing her father breaking down when any anything like that happened and that that some for some of those men it, the war never ended yeah I mean, and it's the nature of modern warfare. I mean, we civil the American Civil War was the first sort of industrial war where you had machine guns and you had railways taking people to the conflict and you had you know massive casualties because of, you're generating these big armies that the railways are getting people to the battlefield. So you have Antietam and these other very large scale uh, numbers of deaths in, in a given battle. Which I think, if you when you think about the Napoleonic Wars, yes, there were large numbers of but there weren't machine guns. Well, there was artillery. Yeah. Was cannon. But the, the, in the second, the first world war, though, it, it upped the ante a thousand times. Okay. You had you had artillery of a, of a firepower that the Civil War had never dreamed about. Mm. Rapid fire machine guns, much faster, much more lethal than in the Civil War. Plus, you had poison gas. Oh uh, yeah. Spread, so men, men were not only being gassed; they were constantly afraid of being gassed. In addition to which, you had flamethrowers. Men were being burned alive by flamethrowers. There are any number of ways of dying. Plus, you could die in the trenches from the diseases, the gangrene that you got from trench foot. And there were just any number of ways of, of being killed and, or of being debilitated that you were constantly aware of and you were constantly afraid. So it, this was a war that, I mean, it really, it was the, the modern industrial war that, out uh, outshone all the ones that had gone before and presumably a lot of this was also happening on the german side and the russian side or the i mean all sides, you know, all sides. in term um it would be an interesting question to know if the germans um had anything similar to craig lockhart or if they well the, Ger the germans had i mean because germany was the world leader in psychiatry they 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 had they you know they had uh, mental hospitals for them they discouraged it more because of, because of the, the Prussian discipline. They discouraged people getting there, but they, once they got there, they could be treated by very good psychiatrists. Freud never treated Chelsea. He wrote about Chelsea, but he didn't. No Austrian soldiers were, were sent to him for treatment. So fast forward to World War II. Is a you know obviously you know think about Iwo Jima or other kinds of um, conflicts. We don't. I mean, you've written about World War II in other contexts um was it as big an issue you mentioned this 20 percent figure uh was it as big an issue in in world war ii or uh well, yes it was it wasn't it was an issue in world war ii um less so because it wasn't a static war when there's movement rivers also wrote when there's movement when you have some control over your conditions you're less likely to break down in in when you're in the trenches you had no control over your, you you couldn't do anything you just waited to be killed when there when there was a, when there was a, an offensive in the Second World War, 
you were less likely because you had some control over your actions. However, mm. that said, 50,000 American soldiers deserted in the Second World War. 100,000 British soldiers deserted in the Second World War. Many of them were suffering from what was now called battle fatigue. They put shell shock behind them and they called it battle fatigue. And thousands of, of soldiers were treated for battle fatigue in the Second World War. And then fast forward to the Vietnam War, obviously there, um, there was mental casualties of the Vietnam War. There are mental casualties on the streets of America today from the Vietnam War to, as I speak. Yeah. Um, and so based on the work that you've done, what is the most effective uh, technique for understanding this, that um, A, this is not a one-size-fits-all answer, and B, that something like shell shock or battle fatigue or whatever may cover a, a range of kind of symptoms and emotions? What, what actually works to get people better? One thing that works, it's only one element, but it's a very important one, is that to know that you're never going to go back to the war again. In the World War I, that was the case. It, uh, it, you know that you're going to be looked after and you're going to go home and you're, you're not going to face those things again. That helps. Oh. Then there, there is good psychoanalysis, good dream analysis, uh, sympathetic reception by your, by your family and your friends. There are hundreds of things. And it, there is no one thing. I, I read about one... American veteran of Iraq and Afghanistan um, who cured himself, and he was in very bad shape. He'd become an, an addict and uh, he was suffering terribly from PTSD and wasn't getting the kind of help he needed from the Veter Veterans Administration, uh, who took up long distance hiking across the Appalachian Trail and the big trails in America. And he's now one of the world leading uh, long distance hikers. Uh, and that's what keeps him going. That's what cured him. I mean, it, it, it could be anything for anybody. That, that, that would just happen to be the one thing that worked for him. But it, as you said, there is no single thing you can, there's no single drug, no single therapy that will do it for everyone. And clearly, you, know, you mentioned the Afghan and the Iraq wars. I mean, if you're in the special operations or the community or the special forces, uh, you may have deployed a dozen times um, to these wars, um, you know, over a period of two decades. I mean, it's it's very stressful. It's 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 a good reason not to have wars. I'm, I'm <laughs> <laughs> um, only the dead have seen the end of war, according to Plato. That's um, right. You've uh, but your and your career has been uh, very much uh, embedded in the question of war and warfare. Um, and so, as you as you think about your next uh, enterprise, what what do you uh, can if you can talk about it? Uh, what might it be? Well, I'm 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 doing research on a, three or four ideas. One of which is a Cold War book. So I might I'm leaning towards that at the moment, and that uh, uh, is a very different kind of war. It was, a, it was a subterranean war in which um, uh, there was no front line, uh, except for the Iron Curtain, but there was no proper front line like in the world war like in world war one but that may be or, or may not i'm not sure i just i'm doing a lot of reading to try and figure out what's <laughs> and you mentioned you found this in a, in a newspaper article this particular book how, how what where, where did you find it and how how did it sort of open oh, it, was, up? it was in the independent when the independent was still a print newspaper in london uh it was just it was just a a, a glancing reference to this place that I'd never heard of, and uh, it just roused my curiosity. It was it wasn't even the article wasn't even about the place. It just it just mentioned it. And um, you know, what are your overall sort of takeaways, having spent um, several years of your life investigating this phenomenon and these these two great poets? Well, I don't know if I have a takeaway. I mean, I I suppose we wouldn't have had their great poetry if they hadn't been um, soldiers, if they hadn't been at war, if they hadn't been warriors. We wouldn't have had the great poetry if they hadn't been treated by two extremely sympathetic doctors. And we probably wouldn't have had their great poetry if they hadn't, if, if Sassoon and Owen had not become friends. There were other poets at Craig Lockhart, but not of that stature. There was one called Max Plowman, who was uh, shell-shocked and wrote poems and published poems, but uh, he never achieve the kind of uh, status that, that Sassoon and Owen did. Well, he was a very interesting man and a, uh, someone who was 
in favor of the war and was dedicated to fighting the war. And even when he came to Craig Lockhart, um, wanted to go back to the front. Uh, but as time went on and he read the Bible and he studied what was happening in the war more and more, he became a pacifist and then finally refused to fight again. And they, they court-martialed him. And of course, most people go into wars thinking they're going to be decisive and short. Um, and certainly that was, I, I think, from reading your book, that was certainly the view at the beginning of World War Run, right? Yeah, all those boys who, in, in, in August of 1914, they were all signing up thinking they'd be home and by Christmas. That was and does, not does that, And does that expectation have an, uh, an effect on this syndrome? To be honest, I don't know. I I, I, yeah. I expect that I expect that it it it's, might be a small factor. But remember that uh, most men didn't break down. Okay, they might have thought they were going to go home sooner, but they they stayed and they didn't break down. It's it. You have yeah. to understand. You have to understand why some men break down and why didn't why some didn't. There were many studies, and there were no one ever came to a conclusion of why some did and some didn't. Um, let me. We've got a, some questions coming here. Okay, from from anonymous. Um, this is so a question about drone pilots, which you may or may not be able to answer. But you know the 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 fact that they're not mobile might that play into kind of any stress they might have. And also, thank you for your awareness of the battle against PTSD and the impact of and its impact. So, um, well, I don't. I mean, when I say that the people were were unable to move, but they were under fire. Yeah, their lives were threatened, and they couldn't do anything to save their lives. They're, you know, if, if a shell hit your dugout, you were dead. You, you, there's nothing much you could do. Uh, or if, if, when your officers ordered you to go over the top into no man's land to go into German machine guns, there was nothing you could do. I, when you're sitting in a drone in a, in a place with uh, in, in Nevada or wherever you are, looking at a television screen, and blowing people up, well, your life isn't threatened at all. So the the, the, the circumstances are completely different. This is a question from Ad Bell Jars. Are modern Western armies today recognizing this problem in a timely manner and acting upon it? Well, I, I can speak for the, the British and the, and the American armies. Uh, they both recognize it. They both have treatment centers for it. But they're not, as so often happens with veterans, they're not adequate to the need. Uh, they, the, more money has to be invested in it. More research has to be done and there has to be greater awareness of what these these men are going through and how it affects their whole lives and and uh, that's just not happening but however it's certainly better than it was and, and and the military is aware of it and the military medical services are dealing with it but they could do a lot better than they're doing going back to, to your book you know officers in particular were um disproportionately affected because they were at the front on the front line is that kind of one of they were disproportionately affected for for a number of reasons one because they were at the front and two they would be in any um uh, battle they would have to lead them in they didn't they didn't send them out they, they and i'm talking about junior officers now second lieutenants lieutenants and captains um there was that plus they had the added burden of responsibility for their men and many when when they would lead their men into battle if their men were killed, they felt a burden of guilt as well that they had lived and the men the men had died. So there were there were added factors to that caused their breakdown that uh, the the non the, the enlisted men didn't face. The enlisted men faced all the other horrors, you know, the, the the risk to their lives and so forth, but they didn't have responsibility for the lives of, of others. And of course, there was a sort of big class element to all of this, right? I mean, in terms of the leadership and how the they were treated compared to the enlisted men. What, how, how did that, how did the class play out in all of this? Well, the treatment for officers was much better than it was for enlisted men, clearly. And, and just as the, the food was better for officers, the, the uh, billets were better for officers. The officers had enlisted men as their servants to do their cooking and cleaning for them. Um, all, all the officers had a much better life in the war than, than enlisted men, and, and um, that, that's that's the class system in Britain, and that was the class system in the British Army. Yeah, I, I went to New College, Oxford, and it's kind of striking. If you go into the chapel there, there's a memorial for the British um, 
people who went to New College Oxford, but there was also a memorial for the Germans who went. And I think um, it, um, and it, I took it partly, you know, if you were a German who was going to New College Oxford before World War I, you were from the upper class. And so yeah. was there, um, I mean, was there a sense of, you know, we're going to play by gentlemen's rules during the war? Oh, you mentioned poison gas. Clearly that is a very, <laughs> uh, you know, outside uh, what the way that we would conduct wars now in general. Um, so how did, how did the, um, the class aspect of the war infect the way that it was fought by the British and the Germans who, after all, I mean, the British royal family is essentially a German. <laughs> uh, did, did it make any difference? Or, you know, the, I mean, it, they were cut. It, it, didn't, it didn't seem to. I mean, uh, each side was pretty brutal to the other. The, the object was yeah. to win. And if it yeah. meant killing thousands of your own men and tens of thousands of the others, you did it. I, I don't. I don't think that anybody was chivalrous because uh, they happened to go to they happened to go to university together. <laughs> and um, and of course the the Russians lost the war early. I mean by 1917, and that contributed substantially to the Russian Revolution. Um, and the war um, played out in. And of course, then when the war ended, we had the Treaty of Versailles, which was a punitive uh, treaty, a peace treaty, which you know to some degree provoked the Second World War. Um, it. Uh, why did you? Why did you select the First World War, having written really about contemporary warfare and World War Two? Well, World War Two, I was writing about when people were still alive that I could interview and I could talk to and I could get their letters and diaries and so forth so it was it was something i it was accessible and i started yeah i was living in paris when i wrote my first world war ii book americans in paris and it just intrigued me that um the city was under german nazi occupation for all those four years uh and and the, the question that in my mind which was probably in the mind of everybody who lived there at the time is what would i do would i resist the germans would i uh, collaborate with them, but I take benefits from it, or would I just try and mind my own business and wait till the war is over? And I, I realized that um, while the French faced this, that there were 5,000 American citizens living in Paris at that time who faced the same questions and answered them in the same way the French did. Some collaborated, some resisted, and some just bided their time. Yeah, you never really know until it happens. <laughs> I mean, you can maybe... It depends uh... on what I, I mean, if I, if I were in Paris... And I was 18 years old and footloose and nothing to lose, I'd probably resist. If I were there and I were 42 and I had three kids in school and I know that if I did anything, they were going to send my children to concentration camp, I would think very carefully about resisting. Yeah. And it I means it's not exactly the same question, but you, the question of who broke down during World War One, uh, there was no way to predict that going in right it just you know you would that would be revealed when you were on the front line or did people or were there a set of circumstances and in which it made it more likely for you to basically have to you know be pulled out on a mental health basis i'm sorry i didn't i i'm are you talking well, so, about so in the same way i mean it's it, not exactly the same question but like you mentioned earlier that who in dream world one who broke down you know it wasn't clear going in who that might be, but as they did more work on the subject, did they come to any conclusions about who was more likely to have to be pulled out on a mental health basis, or is it just sort of randomly distributed? Well, they, they, tried, they, tried, they tried very hard. Uh, they, they tried to look at the mental health history of their families uh, before they enlisted and so forth, but it, it, there didn't seem to be a great correlation. And, and it, uh, there were many studies that they did. There were parliamentary investigations. There were medical investigations. Uh, but nobody came to a conclusion to say, we, we can predict that this person entering the military will break down and this person entering the military will not break down. They never got that far. Right. Well, is there anything you'd like to add in conclusion, Charlie? Uh, and I'll pause well, think I'm just going to mention the book is purchasable by the uh, the button on the right hand side of the screen. I think if you would like um, a great pleasure and a great uh, intellectual adventure and something that will make you think twice about the supporting wars, uh, read Owen's uh, collected works, his collected poems. Um, 
I think of one poem where, where he, he, he's, he's talking about a, a, a man who's dying and men are dying all around. And he says, at the end, my friend, you would not tell with such high zest to children ardent for some desperate glory, the old lie, dolce et decorum est pro patria mori. Um, it, I, 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 read, I want you to read my book because I wrote it <laughs> with that in mind, but I, I, would, I would encourage anybody to read Owen's poetry. It's beautiful. Oh, um, this is a question about Homer. <laughs> It, it, you may have no views on this, but do you think Homer's works are about the veteran experience and psychological and trauma in combat and at home? If you mean the Iliad and the Odyssey, I assume. Yeah. Um, well, the Iliad is about war and the Odyssey is about going home from war. Uh, and, and the Iliad is probably one of the most um, effective and dramatic portrayals of war in all of its gory detail with spears going through throats and men cutting each other to pieces with swords. I mean, it's, it's, uh, I mean, it's, it's, you could say it's an anti-war book if people react to it in that way. There's a, there, what I'm saying, there's a, I opened the book with point. It's from Herodotus, not 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 um, Homer, but it's Herodotus, and he he writes about a man called Epizelus, the son of Cuphagoras, who was in the thick of battle. He was suddenly stricken with blindness, without blow of sword or dart. In this blindness, continued thenceforth during the whole of his life. The following is the account which he himself gave of the matter. He said that a gigantic warrior with a huge beard, which shaded all his shield stood over against him, but the ghostly semblance passed him by and slew the man at his side. Such as I understand was the tale which Epizelus told. Well, I think that, I think Epizelus had PTSD. He had shell shock. <laughs> I think he did, stricken with blindness. Well, Charlie, thank you very much uh, for this, uh, for telling us about the book and good luck with the book tour. And uh, we'll wrap it up now. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Peter. Okay, thank you.